right, well, welcome everyone. This is such a pleasure and uh, a privilege to be invited by the Modern War Institute um, to moderate your keynote discussion tonight. Um, obviously, General Wesley Clark needs no introduction, but I feel that I want to give one anyway, which is to say that he is, uh, it's very special for him to come back here. Many of you may know that he was the valedictorian of the famous class of 1966 here at West Point, about which an entire book has been written. Um, he then was a Rhodes Scholar, went on to the sort of civil-military relations early on in his career as a presidential scholar in the Ford administration, um, a White House fellow, and uh, rose very quickly um, in the military and eventually, of course, became Commander-in-Chief of U.S. Southern Command, Panama, Commander-in-Chief, U.S. European Command, and of course, Supreme Allied Commander in Europe and head of all NATO forces. Um, he has received as well, uh, not only the French Legion of Honor, but, uh, but also the Knight Commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. So recognized not only in the United States, but also across Europe for his service. So uh, General Clark, I wanna begin by asking you to sort of take a 30,000 foot view on the topic that we're talking about for the next few days, which is civil military relations. What, how you would put that in the context um, first historically, let's say, about the proper role of a combatant or a commander in fighting modern war, both in terms of giving advice to civilian leadership and also executing on orders from civilian leaders. So, uh, thanks, Indira. And I want to first uh, congratulate West Point for the Modern War Institute. I think it's a great innovation. And uh, Chuck, thank you for the kind introduction, for laying out the context of this. Uh, Bob Caslon, it's great to see you, and thanks for the great job you've done as superintendent of the Military Academy, as well as your thought leadership in putting this together and helping the Modern War Institute come alive. And uh, Mark Hurtling, uh, one of my old uh, swimming buddies here from West Point, congratulations, and we're delighted you're here. And I'd be remiss, I've got to say hello to Bob Scales, my West Point classmate, former head of the Army War College and a great military historian and somebody who's got a lot to say on this. Now. So you asked me, sort of, so let's quickly look at the field. So the first theater commander really was Winfield Scott. He went to Mexico, 12,000 people conquered the country and uh, worked very closely. And for $20 million, we built the United States of America coast to coast off Winfield Scott. He had presidential aspirations. Uh, President Polk knew it. And he came back and he did run for office uh, and, and uh, or tried to be a candidate and lost. So that was the first of the real commanders in chief. Set aside Grant, go to Pershing. Pershing was picked because uh, Wilson didn't like Leonard Wood. Leonard Wood was close to Theodore Roosevelt. Leonard Wood had champed at the bit responsibly for doing something about World War I uh, and uh, and Pershing was out of that mix. He married a senator's daughter. She died in a house fire. He would led the uh, unfortunate expeditions in Mexico to catch Pancho Villa. He got his instructions. He went to Europe as a two-star, became a four-star, and um, had some really tough times in Europe. We always think of John J. Pershing as a great general, but Pershing actually was uh, he was uh, looked down on by the Allies because the Americans didn't fight well. They wanted to take his, unit, his troops away from the units and use them as fillers. He fought against that. He wasn't totally trusted by the White House. They wanted to put another four-star in Europe to handle the logistics. Pershing started the problem that we had during Vietnam, actually, with the individual rotation and replacement system. He churned those units so badly and uh, so as a result, they, they didn't know how to fight. Pershing didn't know how to fight. He kept talking about open warfare and open maneuver, but nobody knew what that meant. And they were afraid to challenge him and say, what are you talking about? He just didn't want to do trench warfare. So uh, he picked out an offensive to run. He finally got permission to run it. They gave him two weeks. They said, in two weeks, you've got to be on the big show. And when he went to the big show, he didn't do that well. 
And uh, there was a lot of criticism initially, and then the Germans decided it was all over. And Pershing said, you can't let, you can't take an armistice with the Germans because they haven't been defeated. If you give in to the Germans and, and let them stop right now, we'll be back here to finish this fight. Pershing's mistake was he said it to the generals, they blew it off. The British were like, are you crazy? I mean, we've lost, you know, a generation of men. It's time to stop. Pershing sent the letter up to the political level, and there was serious discussion in Washington that maybe they would fire him because he was trespassing on political determination of when the war would be over. But the war ended. Pershing came home. Everybody decided to make it a, a great success and a celebration, and Pershing rode off into the sunset. There were a little bit of ripples that maybe he might become president, but, but nothing ever happened. And Pershing lived on through World War II and finally passed away in 1948. George C. Marshall had worked for Pershing, respected him, and consulted with him, but Pershing had the misfortune of presiding over the drawdown of the United States Army in the 1920s. He was our first regional commander-in-chief. As you go through this list, what you see is there's nobody that hasn't had problems with Washington. So Ike was lucky. I mean, he had Marshall who protected him. After Kazarine, there was serious effort by the Brits to get Ike fired. And if it hadn't been for, for a marshal recognizing that firing Ike was a, a blow to Marshall and a blow to the United States, Ike might have been gone because he'd spent most of the of month of November in Spain arguing with the Vichy French about whether they were going to provide resistance or surrender. His first trip to the battlefield was to approve Lloyd Friedendahl's dispositions that led to the defeat at the Battle of Kazarine Pass. So Ike had trouble. He came back from it. He almost resigned over Montgomery's desire to be the ground component commander in Europe. And Ike said, I'm willing to resign over this. But we had the preponderance of power, and Ike prevailed in Montgomery still fought him, but never got to be the ground component commander after the, both the core, uh, both army groups got in. MacArthur in Korea, his job was to win. He figured out how to win at Incheon. They didn't tell him he couldn't go north of the 38th parallel. They let him do it. Now, the Incheon landing was opposed. It was opposed by the Joint Chiefs. So, uh, Omar Bradley didn't go out, but he sent J. Lawton Collins, the Army Chief of Staff, out, the Chief of Naval Operations, and the Vice Chief of the Air Force out to tell MacArthur he couldn't do it. History books differ on this, but I got my interpretation from General Haig, who was a captain sitting outside the room in the, in the Daiichi building in Japan in September when this happened. So they came to tell, they asked MacArthur to brief the plan. He briefed, he had somebody brief it. And then they gave him 15 reasons in questions why it wouldn't work. Some of the history books will tell you that MacArthur gave a brilliant exposition that caused people to change their minds. But actually what happened, according to General Haig, was that MacArthur simply listened to this. He steamed. These guys were nothing. And MacArthur was a brigadier general in World War I. They weren't fighting. They didn't know what they were doing. He'd won the Pacific. He knew exactly what he had to do to win it in John. He was a master of amphibious assault. So rather than have a dialogue with him, he took his pipe, knocked it on the table, picked up his papers, stood up and said, gentlemen, there'll be an Inchon landing or you'll have yourselves a new commander in chief far east and walked out. So he got the landing, made a lot of enemies in the process. And the enemies watched him, and the enemies kept score. And in the Joint Staff, which was still the Joint Staff in those days, the Navy lieutenants and the Army captains and the Army majors knew they were dealing with a really arrogant, difficult field commander. After the Chinese came in, they thought MacArthur panicked. After the um, Chinese had pushed back against the 38th parallel, he wrote a message to Washington saying three choices. Evacuate, use nuclear weapons, or seek an armistice. People didn't like the nuclear weapons option in there. 
and Truman flirted around with it for a while, and it caused a lot of problems. But MacArthur's major problem was he wasn't getting along with the Joint Staff, and he was talking to Congress on the, on the backside. He had a lot of friends in Congress. MacArthur had run twice already for the presidency. In 1944, as an Army general fighting in the Pacific, he was secretly in communication with the Republicans, trying to get the Republican nomination. Again, in 1948, he was on active duty as a five-star in the occupation of Japan, trying to get the Republican nomination. Failed in both cases. So he was a known political quantity. And he was communicating with uh, the Senate, and, uh, and one, of the, one of the people in Congress released a letter he'd written that was critical of the administration. And at the same time, MacArthur had sent an ultimatum to the Chinese, essentially threatening dire consequences if they didn't call off the fighting. All this converged, and ultimately, um, with the concurrence of the Joint Chiefs, including George C. Marshall, who was Secretary of Defense at the time, MacArthur was relieved of command. He was simply a guy trying to do his job and win, and he got in trouble. So you can go through the long list. You wanted me to go over some of the history. Right. And I mean, it goes on and on. There's nothing but difficulty in this. So I want to go back to what Chuck Jacoby said in laying this out. Uh, I'm not going to be able to stay and be with you for this, but I hope you'll be realistic about what the real challenges are. When you're a battalion commander or company commander, you're given a mission. You may not have all the support you need, and you go back to your boss and say, I need, I need help. I need engineers. I need, a, I need the priority of fires from the mortar platoon. I need, I need GS artillery here to back me. And you have that out. And it's within the context of military professionalism. And it's usually face to face. And it's based on mutual respect and cultural understanding. When you get to be a theater commander at the top level, all that goes out the window. You're in a political realm. Everybody understands that George Washington believed in civilian control. But everybody understands also that George Washington, Ulysses Grant, um, Andrew Jackson, and Dwight Eisenhower were famous generals who went on to political careers. And that's never far from the minds of those who've made a profession of politics. They know what this is like. So they're judging you as military professionals by a different standard. And this is a very hard thing for military people to understand. When you get to a certain level, you have to know how people on the political side think. They don't think the same way that you're taught to think. It's not about duty, honor, country at the top level. I'm not saying they're unethical. It's just a different way of thinking. You know, politics is the, the great art of politics is to make people believe that you're with them. So politicians are very good at listening to what generals say and say, boy, you make a lot of sense to me. You make a lot of sense. And they'll give you a lot of positive feedback. But that doesn't mean that they've made the decision that you're going to get what you want. You can walk out of that room and feel good about it. But that's what they're good at, is making you feel good. What they're not used to is you're challenging them and telling them the hard truths to power. That they're not comfortable with, because that's not their culture. And so every theater commander, at some point, comes to this problem. And the only thing I can tell you is I go back to the lessons I picked up from history and what I learned as a junior officer. And I tried to live in my career, which was that when you're put in position, you should fight for success. Whether you're a company commander, a battalion commander, or a brigade commander, or a theater commander, your job is to win. It gets more complicated as you go up. If they want you to lose or have a draw, somebody should have to tell you that. That shouldn't be you. And when you get the four stars on your shoulder, you have to be brave enough and smart enough to work at the political level and take your risks. You know, there's no great shame in 
being removed from command or replaced because you were fighting to win. But there is shame in not having fought and then losing. And it's a really tough problem because in the military, this is not our culture. You know, when the brigade commander tells you, you've got to hold that hill no matter what, you're going to hold the hill no matter what. You're not going to go back and say, well, sir, you know, if you'll let me just pull like 50% off, I can, I can hold it just as well and I'll save my unit and blah, blah. He said, hold the hill. You hold the hill. But when you're the theater commander, you're shaping the whole process of the conflict. And so it's a different challenge. The orders you're following are not orders from refined military professionals. They're orders from people who see the problem from the Washington perspective and think about the problem in a much different way. So you have to have a constructive dialogue with them, not just swallow it and say, aye, aye, sir, three bags full, we'll do it the way you say. How to do that, that's the art of high-level command. Well, there's uh, you know, many experiences you could tell from your own, um, your own career, but one that immediately jumps to my mind when I hear you just say that is the experience that you had when the decision was made suddenly on a Saturday that we were going to invade Haiti. And uh, there's, a, there's a story I've heard you tell about General Shali Kashvili um, coming into the room with the Joint Chiefs and, uh, and, and informing you all that that was going to be happening and you all weren't too right pleased about it. Why don't you tell us that story? What, how, sure. what well, was the decision making <clears throat> okay, so through your head at that I point? became the J-5 in early April of 1994 and we had major problems, much like you do today. There was no strategy. Nobody believed, nobody knew what we were doing at the end of the Cold War. We were shooting down Serb aircraft over Yugoslavia. Um, we were getting ready to go with nor to war with North Korea if they didn't let us look at the spent nuclear fuel. We had a raging conflict going in Central Africa in Rwanda. Um, and uh, we had a drug problem and a major issue with the headquarters in the U.S. Southern Command. And um, then we had um, a total economic embargo of Haiti. And the junta in Haiti wouldn't leave. And so planning began to be done to a military invasion to take them out. So um, we went through the motions of planning. Um, we went to the United Nations. Madeleine Albright and I negotiated with Boutros Ghali up there and got a UN mission to uh, succeed, so we had an exit strategy for the U.S. forces. And on Labor Day weekend, um, I was in the office that Saturday morning, along with the J5, J3 and uh, the director of the Joint Staff, we're sitting around Charlie Kashvili's little table. And he comes back from a meeting over at the White House and says, um, in the way Shali did with his Polish accent, he would say, now we will find out who's the real soldiers are. The planning for Haiti must be done by Monday night. <laughs> then bzz, the phone to the White House rings. He get, gets up. You know, we look around. I look around the table. He comes back, and I said, well, sir, we don't see any problem with that. We'll work all weekend, but this is just a drill, right? And so he looks at the three of us, and he says, this is no drill. He said, I'm not supposed to tell you, but the decision has been made. We will invade Haiti on September, I think it was the 22nd. He said, and this is the time for any of you who don't feel right to leave. So I looked at the, I looked at the director of the Joint Staff, I looked at the J3, we were looking around, it's like, okay, I mean, but look, you're going against 1,400 members of the FOD, a sort of carabinieri force, with five broken down Cadillac 150 armored cars. That's it. That's, that's the plan. We've got like two divisions going in. W would I have done it? I'm thinking, no. I mean, I'd, no. I mean, why would you invade 80? But, you know, it's the president's call. 
It was, there was a UN Security Council resolution. It was legal. I'm not leaving. So we stayed. But Shali knew there was a sensitivity to this. You said that it was not something worth quitting over. Um, right. I wonder whether there have been other times in your career where you've thought, ooh, that actually is worth quitting over, or there is something that this president is asking me to do that I can't do. Have there been other times? No, it, it never happened. But you see, what happens to most of us is that you spend 20, 30 years in the military, and you're in the military culture. And when you're a staff officer, you don't know that much about what's going on. I was in the Pentagon in the morning of 19, October of 1983, and I was in General Maxwell Thurman's office. I was a colonel, and Max was the vice chief of staff of the Army. And he always, he's a technical guy, so he would come to me and ask me about strategy and stuff like this. So I'm in there at 7 o'clock in the morning, we were watching the Today Show, and then there's the rumor that U.S. troops are going to invade Grenada. I said, sir, look at this. They're saying we're going to invade Grenada. Can you believe anything like that? He said, Wesley, watch. <laughs> he knew. It was a compartmented operation. Of course, I had no re need to know. I was leading some think tank for him, and I wasn't in on it. So there's a lot you don't know, and there's things that you might have objected to that just happen. You're just part of the big machine. So only a few years, maybe only a year or two, when you're in uniform at the top level where you are actually confronted with those kinds of decisions. I know that you were an opponent of the Iraq War under President George W. Bush, and that you spoke at the time about how you may have opposed it, um, but that it's the job of the military to do what the president says. And I've also heard you say that actually it was the job of civilians in Congress to, if they wanted to change the strategy, it wasn't about exactly the surge or the number of soldiers on the ground. At that point, this is 2007, you were talking about it really was for elected politicians to put the pressure on the president. Explain that a bit, because it goes to your point about obeying, you know, going along with civilian leadership, but how other civilians need to be actually taking the lead. Well, I don't know, <clears throat> you know exactly what the experiences of everybody in the room are, but my experience was that the, I was retired at that point. I came through the Pentagon in the, um, two weeks after 9-11. I was on CNN every day. I, had, I was doing what Mark's doing now. And um, I was on literally four or five times a day. I couldn't get off. And it made me very uneasy because when you're in uniform, somebody's always there to sort of help you know what to say publicly. And now I was freelancing it. I wasn't, didn't have access to any intel or anything. And I'm, you know, I'm saying this is Osama bin Laden. So I wanted to come back to the Pentagon, sort of check signals. I went to see Secretary Rumsfeld, whom I knew from the Ford administration. I went to see Paul Wolfowitz, whom I had uh, known also from conferences and we had lockers next to each other in the POAC for a few months. And uh, then as I was leaving, I was called in by an officer on the joint staff. And he said, um, he said, sir, I got to talk to you. I said, you're too busy. He said, no, sir, you got to come in here and hear this. He said, we're going to invade Iraq. And this is just after 9-11. I said, 9 -11. this is like two weeks after 9-11. I said, we are? He said, did we, I said, did we find that, that it was Saddam? He said, no, no, there's nothing like that. He said, I said, well, then why are we invading Iraq? He says, I don't know. I, he said, I guess it's because we're not any good against terrorists, and, and, but, but we're good at taking down states. So I watched as this thing emerged, and um, I listened to my friends who were still in uniform and some of the retirees who didn't and couldn't speak out, and so I began to speak out. Um, and as... I mean, you're always a cheerleader for the guys that you've worked with and believe in. So you want the mission to succeed. But you also try to see the larger picture. And the larger picture was it became increasingly clear that there was no phase four in the Iraq operation. I went to see the J-5. I asked the J-5, who had my old job eight years later, I said, what's phase four? He said, no phase four. I said, but there has to be a phase four, phase three being decisive operations. 
I said, there has to be a phase four. He said, he pointed to the ceiling, to the offices of the Secretary of Defense and said, nope, they won't let us. So there was really an absence of planning and the combination of really not needing to go in and then an absence of planning for what we were going to do when we got there and got to Baghdad. I never had any doubt we'd be in Baghdad in three weeks. But what was going to happen then? And so that was the problem, and that's what I try to speak out against. But mm -hmm. as I critique my own effort, I failed because I spoke out as a military guy. I tried to be respectful. I tried to suggest that there was a, you had to look at this very carefully for what the implications were and the consequences and what it meant in the region. I spoke like a general who was trying to give advice over on a White House staff meeting, um, when in reality, if you were going to head this off, you had to speak absolutely plainly and say, you know, this is BS. This is an unnecessary war that's poorly planned and shouldn't be executed. I didn't do that, so I failed. It was a hard transition to go from being in the military and being on the inside to going on the outside and still loving and respecting the guys and gals that had served with me. And so I felt like, and I feel like today, that I didn't do the job right. Now, I will tell you that this is a pretty common failing. So if you go back and look at the former Army chief who in 1955 did the study for Ike that said, what would it take if we actually have to go into Vietnam and rescue the French, or maybe this was 1953, 54, he did the study, um, General Ridgway. And the, the answer was between half a million and a million men. And so in 1963 and 64 and 65, people would go to him and they'd say, Matt, you did the study. Come on, say what this is about. And General Ridgway never would say. That was his definition of civil military relations. My definition is that just like if you're a doctor and people ask you about medicine, or if you're a lawyer and they ask you about law, if you've spent your, less, your lifetime in the armed forces and you're retired or you've served as a troop out there, there's nothing wrong about giving your judgment informed by your experience. You told me that you have sort of three guiding principles when it comes no. to civil-military relations. Today. Well, I told you there were three issues. Right. So the, the, the first, I'll let you say them, but, but about having a non-politicized right. armed forces. Secondly, at the top, you have to have people who can work with political leaders. And then third, you were talking about what happens when people retire or leave service. Should they speak or be enjoined from speaking? You are reflecting on your own experience saying that you failed, that you didn't speak out in the way you should have. Right. So today, okay, here we are, fast forward to 2018. What is going on that you think you should be speaking out about? Well, you know a lot about North I, Korea. I've already spoken out on Korea. There's no military option that we're going to come up with that satisfies the um, a risk-free takeout of the Korean nuclear position and North Korean nuclear. And, and if there were, after you did it, you'd be left with the same problem we've had for the last 40 years. They have chemical weapons, they have biological weapons, and they have hundreds of artillery pieces to punish Seoul with. So the nuclear pieces is a special twist of this that's made it worse. So. I've written on this, a lot of other people have written on this and talked about it. So I think I'm okay on that one. So the bloody nose strike, impossible. I don't think you're gonna, I don't think there's a good military option for a bloody nose strike. Now, you could imagine some options in which, let's say, you send the special forces in, you plant mines uh, or, or booby traps on the bottoms of sh ships in a harbor, and uh, they sail out and boom, 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 and all the sink ships in the harbor sink. You say, well, surely he wouldn't attack Seoul because you sunk half his navy. Well, it depends. Maybe he would, maybe he wouldn't. But when you, if he wouldn't, then the question is, what did you get out of the action? Did, did that mean you sunk you know, a few ships in a, in a harbor 
Is he therefore going to say, okay, 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 I give up my nuclear weapons? No, I don't think so. So I think we have to see the Korea problem in a different context. Problem we've had, and I was part of the backstop team for Bob Gallucci in 94. The problem we've had is twofold. Number one is we think it's about us and North Korea, but that's what North Korea wants us to think. It's really about North Korea and South Korea. And number two is it's not about the nuclear weapons. It's about how do these two states live together on the peninsula. We're only there because we don't trust the North Korean intentions. Because every time we try to talk to North Korea, it's really a pretty easy formula. We say, what do you really want? They say, ah, we want a non-aggression treaty, uh, you know, peace with you. You sign the agreement, promise us you won't attack us, uh, and then we want you to leave. And then let the Koreans settle the problem among themselves. It's an easy three-part formula. But I think, you know, there's enough of us speaking out that the bloody nose thing, I don't think we're going to create anything on this. I know there's efforts to do so. There's people talking about, gee, can you do this and can you do that? But the truth is that we need a real solution to Korea, not just kicking the can down the road. If Donald Trump can do it, he deserves a Nobel Peace Prize. But it won't be done by a handshake at Panmunjom with the North Korean leader. It can only be done by a detailed diplomatic, economic, humanitarian, and military process that extracts from the North the military pullback, the transparency, the confidence building measures, and the constraints on forces that let them, enable them to receive economic and humanitarian assistance and diplomatic recognition. So, so this is a complicated thing to explain. But, you know, I'm hearing a lot of retired military speak out on this one. I think this is clear. Iran is not so clear. Before we move over to Iran, are, you have spoken out about it. Other retired military have. Have you been able to carry that message into the White House? I know you worked with John Kelly for years. I know you know General McMaster. He's no longer in that position, of course, and we don't know if I think they Kelly have the. I, I think they have the message. They have the I message. Think, yeah. Have they conveyed it to the president? Well, I think, I think they have. And, uh, you know, I don't, I mean, we're, we're on the record here. So um, I have to be careful what I say about this. But, you know, from my conversations with people in the White House and around the president, he doesn't want a war. So he wants a solution. But in my view, we've got to solve the right problem. If we simply solve, if we, if we end up having to withdraw in return for their saying, we'll give up the nuclear weapons, that's not an acceptable solution. What about Iran? It looks now like in May we have this deadline ticking up about the recertification, certainly with uh, Bolton in that new job. Uh, I think a lot of people are assuming that the Iran deal will not continue. Yeah. Well, Iran is actually a distraction at this point. I mean, the real re issue is Russia in Syria and what can be done about it. Now, President Obama said it'll be a quagmire. It doesn't look like a quagmire to me yet. Looks to me like they're pretty entrenched. They're going after the oil resources. They just uh, have signed an exclusive agreement with Syria so that all of Syria's economic reconstruction of its oil resources to the $30 billion tune or so will be paid for by Russia. Uh, they'll probably come to Western European banks and get loans for this. But they have control of it. And with that, they're working to uh, be able to develop Syrian oil and gas and offshore gas and be able to extend their grip further into Europe. So this is a direct competition with the United States on energy access to Europe. And uh, that's the real story here. The Iran issue is a, it's a distraction. I know it's very annoying to the Saudis that the Iranians are there. I know the Saudis are very unhappy with the bridge. But actually, the Israelis are working with the Russians as well and talking to the Russians about how to deconflict and get along in there. People who aren't at the table to a sufficient degree are, is the United States of America. We're hanging on by our fingernails in there with our small force in Syria. And the question is, 
what will we be able to do on, on this? Um, and the dilemma for the, the Trump administration is that they don't seem to want to speak out against Russia. So that speaking out against Iran is a nice distraction. Well, you know Russia so well from having led NATO. So what is your interpretation of what's happening now? We've just had Putin re-elected, re-anointed, whatever you want to call it. Um, what, you know, what is your view of how the U.S. should be dealing with Russia? Well, let me take this back into the civil military thing Thank to you. answer what Chuck has charged us with. Because I know you want to talk about policies, but we want to talk about what do the military guys do. So I think, you know, McMaster gave a very clear speech in Munich at the security conference talking about Russia. And I think the national security strategy that McMaster authored and his team is very clear talking about Russia. The question is whether the Joint Chiefs and working up through the White House and the machinery can do anything to shape U.S. policy or whether it's simply a two-level policy. The so-called deep state, which is everybody in this room, I guess, uh, of people who are interested in America and have experience feels one way, and at the political level, there's something else going on, and the two aren't directly connected yet. So that's the challenge that the military leadership has today, is how to make that connection, how to get through and carry the story that they believe is the correct story based on all of the available intelligence and their experience in uniform. How do you carry that to the political level with a president who wants to reshape the relationship with Russia? And? It's a, it's a tough challenge. That's the art of high-level leadership for the military. So I'm not going to tell General Dunford and, and his team how to do it. General Scaparotti is a NATO commander. I know he's seized with the issue. But how you do it in a way that, you know, when you speak out too strongly, what happens to you is what happened to Secretary of Defense Mattis when he was a Central Command commander speaking out about Iran in the face of the Obama administration. What had happened in the Obama administration was that there was a determination that um, it would be a serious problem if Iran got nuclear weapons and that if the if the diplomacy didn't work, there'd be no alternative but to use force. And so the president entered a diplomatic process. And uh, when you enter a diplomatic process and there's no acceptable alternative, you're probably not going to get the kind of outcome that you're looking for. Uh, and when Jim tried to explain that, uh, he just, he didn't, he, he became someone who wasn't fully cooperative with the administration. And when you do that at the high level, that's fine. That's your obligation as a professional to speak the truth to power. When you've got your four stars, that's it. You're not going to be a five star, and you're not going to run for president, and you're not going to, you know, it's it, it, it just, you don't know. You've done as much as you can do. You've been selected, and there you are, and you speak the truth. So I give Jim Mattis a lot of credit for standing up for what he believed at the time. I want to come back to But the question is always, if you get inside it, could it have been done a different way? So he got his point across and didn't get pushed out. Right. That's the challenge. That's right. And I do want to come back to that because I also want to talk about a contrast between the Marines and Army um, in terms of the sort of soldier statesman. I'd like to get back to that. But, you, you know, I know that you um, were very moved by the speech that MacArthur, of course, gave here at West Point, and that your class had to memorize it. And I understand that you actually have a print on your wall of MacArthur giving that speech. Right. Um, and of course, it spoke very clearly to this question of civil military relations. But in fact, he didn't live it in the way that he spoke about it. Um, you know, you, you said, oh, you, you're, if you're a four star, you're not going to become a five star, you're not going to run for president. But you yourself ran for president after all. So, so tell us about the contrast between that speech and how, how it actually plays out. Well, I think when relations. MacArthur gave the speech, and for those of you that haven't seen it, just go to, to Yahoo and type in MacArthur's speech at West Point. It's, I mean, it's, you have to read it. It's the starting point, and it's so eloquent, and it's so inspirational. And uh, there was a cadet named Jim Ellis 
who um, retired as an Army three-star, who was the first captain and thought to record it. Other than that, there had never been a transcript of it. It's an amazing speech, and it speaks to what we believe military professionalism is at the troop level. It's what it means to be a lieutenant and a captain and a major. When you get into the senior ranks, it's not always so simple. And MacArthur wasn't talking to a bunch of generals. He was talking to a bunch of cadets. And it was a message that, you know, my class lived and died with in Vietnam. We believed it. We believed that it wasn't up to us to worry about policies. It was up to us to win the battles we were put into. And that's what we did. And that's what we ask of every junior officer and field grade officer and senior officer in the United States Armed Forces. That is, of course, what is asked of every junior officer and every officer. But at the top, you end up having to understand the political. And having to deal with civilian leadership at the highest level means being savvy, knowing how to work the system. And let's face it, you might have been controversial at times, but you were savvy and you did know how to work the system. And, you know, I know that you had your conflicts with Richard Holbrook, for example, in, uh, in Bosnia or in Kosovo. And then also I know that you were against the um, Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. And when you were talking to General Shali Kashvili about that, he said, don't put me at odds with the SECDEF on this. So, I mean, you have experienced this firsthand. Give us a couple examples of how it comes out. What are yeah. Well, I think, I think I probably had too brittle a view of military professionalism because my contemporaries went through Vietnam. And what we saw were senior officers who knew there was a better way to do this but couldn't seem to speak up and get it done. And if you go back into the record book, a lot of the blame falls on General Westmoreland who had President Johnson's ear, not the Joint Chiefs. In 64, when the policies were being decided, the Joint Chiefs said, you should go in across Laos and cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail, and you should isolate. You can't win a battle. You can't win in a theater unless you can isolate the theater of operations. Now, that's just, you know, that's just a fact. And we didn't isolate Vietnam effectively. And there were a lot of halfway attempts to do so, McNamara's wall. And then when we finally did invade Laos, it was too late. It was 1971, and we couldn't put US troops in there. All we could do is put in the Vietnamese. And by that time, the North Vietnamese forces were formidable, and they were ready to fight, and they fought hard. So we lacked the strategy in Vietnam to do what we needed to do. And my contemporaries and I felt like we made it a resolve that we would never let the United States, we would never let this happen again. I was fortunate enough to be on the um, Chief of Staff's transition team with Colin Powell when General John Wickham came in in 1983. I just graduated from the War College and they picked me and Dan Chrisman and Steve Silvesi and Bill Hartzog as the junior officers, Dave Mead <clears throat> as the junior officers on this. And then we had some full colonels and some one stars. And then it was headed by Colin Powell. And we'd done all the issue work behind it. And um, I stayed behind to help General Powell put that together. And he was, he and I were talking, he said, you know, you need a cover sheet on this. I mean, this is just a bunch of eaches. What to do about pay, what to do about training, what to do, what's the big picture? And it was due that night. So he and I wrote up the cover sheet. And the first lesson was, it was, uh, we called it overwhelming force. Don't ever let us be piecemealed and graduated into combat again. We don't ever want a fair fight. When we go into combat, we go in to win and win decisively. And he took that to Wickham. And, um, and Wickham said that in the tank, when they invaded Grenada, that was the guiding principle. So there was a Cuban engineer brigade in Grenada in 1983, and we put 20,000 Americans in. A couple of Ranger battalions, 82nd Airborne, the Marines got in on the action. And the press, they got all upset. Oh, is this not fair? You're ganging up. And, well, it's just, uh, you know, 
David and Goliath think, yeah. And that's the way we want to fight every time. So that was what I came through my military career as. And yet when I got to Washington, I worked for Sholley. Sholley was very subtle. So I was the J-5, and we're talking about things like the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. It's like, you know you can't, you cannot move forward with nuclear weapons and keep pace with the Russians without testing. But as we're going to the White House meeting, he said, Wes, he said, don't put me at odds with the SECDEF. And so I realized that he was, rather than simply saying, no, this CTBT is a really bad thing, he was going to go along with it and then extract the money necessary to do the full testing and without, um, with, with, with uh, computer simulation and with lasers and other things, rather than fighting the issue with the administration, which the administration had already decided it was doing CTBT. So he finessed it. So but, he finessed it. But you were put in a situation with Richard Holbrook, if I recall, where uh, you were sitting at a table, he wanted you, he was pushing you on something, Warren Christopher showed up, he wanted you to approve his view, I think it was about making Sarajevo completely demilitarized, and you said, we can't do that, and Holbrook said, yes, we can, uh, Secretary Christopher shows up and he just says, uh, yes, Wesley Clark is with me on this, right, Wes? And you said, uh, no, I'm not, and That's then what right. happened? No, I did. I mean, it, <laughs> I hated to do that to Richard Holbrook. But the way Richard operated was he was a very subtle Washington player. So he I've never heard him called subtle, he could I write, have to say. He could write to the White House. <laughs> he could get permissions on things. I'll give you another example. So we stopped the conflict. It was um, early in, must have been the, the first week of September. And the Croatian military was running roughshod over the Serbs in Bosnia. They had taken care of the Dalmatian coast. They had taken care of the problem in Bihać, which was the far western side of Bosnia. <clears throat> and they were moving toward Banja Luka. And um, Holbrook, of course, had no obligation to ask me what to do. He simply came in that Sunday morning, and we were in Zagreb, Croatia, and said, White House wants us to tell them to cease operations right now. Well. Okay, I mean, Jim Pardue and I went to see Minister Shushak in the, at 8 a.m. in this darkened Ministry of Defense building in Zagreb. And Shushak says, we have come them on the run. We're on the last high ground on Banya Luka. Their army is collapsing. The Serbs are shooting people in the street. This will soon be over. Well, I'm a military guy. Think, <laughs> That's a good thing. Finish it. But we had to tell him, we said, Minister, the White House says, that's it. Stop it, and stop it right here. So um, Holbrook and Chris Hill at the same time were with Tuchman, and they told Tuchman to stop it. So um, that day we went to Italy, and then I persuaded Holbrook that we had to go in and see Milosevic that night, because if they were in that bad a position, that maybe this was the time to seal the deal and take advantage of their weakness with diplomacy. So we diverted, 11 o'clock we show up, <clears throat> we, and we said in the car going in, we said, God, I hope he doesn't make us eat again. He's always giving us like three meats in this huge served meal, like you have to eat the pork, the beef, the chicken have the pair of brandy, and sit there and, and entertain with him. It's too late for that. So we get there, and Milosevic says, he says, gentlemen, it's too late to have dinner, and, um, and therefore uh, we'll have light refreshments. And we start talking, he says, I know you've come here to take my surrender, he said, but there'll be no surrender, he said. We have General Milanovic in charge now in Banja Luka, and he's a good man. So obviously, our conversations were recorded and broadcast to Milosevic. He was monitoring everything we were saying. Now, where he was getting it from, I don't know. Maybe from the embassy cable traffic, maybe from something we were saying on secure comms, 
maybe from the car. But uh, we had that, Holbrook and I had that kind of a relationship. But we ended up at Dayton, and he wanted to then uh, disarm the city of Sarajevo, which had a million people in it. And I'm like, wait a minute. I mean, Shawley put me on this thing to make sure we don't ask the military to do things that they can't do. Disarming a city, that's not a military task. We don't know how to do it. And we're not going to go dig in people's cellars with a bunch of NATO troops and try to see if they've got AK-47s buried two feet under the concrete in the cellar. So I said, no, you can't. We're not going to do it. And it, it was at that point I'd already, I knew, the, I knew the Muslims wouldn't agree to it because they knew that we couldn't do it. But Holbrook was like looking for a compromise and an easy way to sell it to the Serbs and get the agreement done. So we never finished our discussion. He cut me off, and then Christopher showed up, and Secretary Christopher is sitting there, and Holbrook then describes the progress of the negotiation and said, and we're going to declare Sarajevo a disarmed city. And uh, Wes, that's, uh, that's, you agree with that, right? And I said, well, Mr. Secretary, no, I don't agree. And uh, that hasn't been cleared by the Joint Chiefs. So that was all I could do. So Christopher looked at me, he looked at Holbrook. Holbrook, of course, was a little bit upset about this. And, and Christopher stands up, strides out of the room. We're sort of, Holbrook's like, Wes, what the hell? We talked about this. I said, yes, we talked about it. And we didn't agree. And so 10 minutes later, Christopher comes back to the room and says, I've talked to the Secretary of Defense. The Joint Chiefs approve this. So, okay, I got outvoted. So <laughs> then he had to take the proposal to the Muslims. <laughs> President Izebegovic, the Muslim leader, said not only no, but in, in Bosnian terms, hell no. No way. And so it died. Ended up getting your way anyway. <laughs> but, yes, because that's your job, is you're supposed to know what the issues what are, and, and you're work. supposed to, you know, do the best you can to give the right advice, even when it's painful, and even when some people don't want to hear it. All right, we have about 15 minutes for questions, and I know there are a lot of people who will want to have a chance to ask their own questions of you. So I want to invite you to stand up. Um, I think there's a microphone coming around, hopefully. Um, but if not, at least if you could stand up and identify yourself when you ask your question. Uh, General, 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 General Clark. Bill Carter, Center for New American Security. Thank you, General Clark. Um, you mentioned that one of your core principles was an apolitical military, and I thought I would uh, take you on that and say it's good to see you again. Ten years ago, I took you around Florida as the Obama campaign's national veterans director, the campaign, and four years yeah. before that, you yeah. were the president. Yeah. I was wondering if you could reflect on the last 15 years or so of general officers getting involved in politics after they leave service, the effect that has back on the profession, and maybe also, if you've got time, the effect of H.R. McMaster serving as an active duty officer in a political role today. Yeah, well, let me take the easy one first. Colin Powell served as an active duty military officer's national security advisor. And uh, Doug Lute was there for two administrations in the NSC staff. And we've always had military guys in the, in the White House. But um, I told Indira that there are three real issues with military, civil military relations. Number one is keep the military apolitical and then uh, to speak truth to power and give military advice as a senior officer. And then number three, what about the retired community? So I was dismayed to find that the military wasn't as apolitical as I had thought it to be. But then I reflected on my own experience and realized we'd never been apolitical. Now, most of the, my contemporaries were all, we all supported the Republicans because how could you support the Democrats? They were constantly against the defense budget. They were against technology. They didn't want to move forward with anything. They were like, cut, 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 don't see a need for it. Whereas we were looking at the threat, we couldn't persuade the Democrats that there was a threat. You know, even during the Cold War, Democrats and Republicans never really agreed on the threat from the Soviet Union. Um, and so uh, I guess we had always been oriented toward the Republicans. But people I knew were not card-carrying members of a party. They just were inclined 
to whoever was going to be stronger on national security. When I ran for office, I discovered that, <clears throat> contrary to what I believed, there were actually lots of people in the military who were card-carrying members of parties. And um, especially in the Marine Corps, there was a very strong Republican Party organization inside the Marine Corps. Now, whether how organized it was, I don't know. But I dealt with one of the radio shock jocks in Phoenix who asked me how I could be a Democrat and be a military guy. And I said it's because in the military we learned that the organization's no good, no better in performance than the troops at the bottom of the organization. That as your troops are, so your unit will perform. I said that's that's what I believe and what that means in politics is you gotta look after education and health care and housing for ordinary Americans. So I thought it was a pretty easy transition. And I often joked, you know, I grew up in a socialist economy. I was living in government housing, had a government job, and everybody got paid about the same thing, and all the kids went to the same government schools. That was socialism. So I asked him, how can you be a Republican? He said, oh, all of my friends, uh, you know, I was a lieutenant in the Marines, and we're all Republicans. We all have, you know, we're members of the party. I was really shocked at that. I think it's okay, people have their own views on things, but I think it's important to keep the political discussion out of the active armed forces. And I say that with respect to the people in uniform in this room. We don't want to know what your party affiliation is. And nobody should ever ask you how you vote. And nobody should take a poll. And nobody should be doing uh, outreach to you. And politicians shouldn't put you on the stage when they give a partisan speech. That's called using the military, and it's called abusing the military. So I didn't exactly like it when President Obama came up to West Point and gave his Afghanistan speech up here. I don't know, Bob, if you were here then. I thought it was a mistake. <laughs> and all you had to do was look at TV and look at a bunch of cadets in Eisenhower Hall sort of wishing to go back to their rooms and study and write letters and stuff and <laughs> listen to this guy drone on about policy and think, <laughs> White House made a mistake on this one, but that wasn't overtly political. What I see is people that go out and try to put the troops on stage and campaign for a party. That's, a, that's, that, that's just wrong. So, um, so that's, that's my view on the first of these issues. We talked a lot about the second one. I don't see any problem with retired people um, speaking out on the basis of their experience. And I don't see any problem with veterans being organized. We've done it for 150 years in America. The Grand Army of the Republic was the first of these organizations, and it was composed of all the veterans of the Union Army, and there were about <coughs> two million of them. And they had an active voice in politics, and then they became the first equivalent of the veterans groups. So you have the veterans on foreign wars. They have a full agenda. You have the American Legion. It has a full agenda. And to some extent, these people vote. They're not single-issue voters like the NRA members are, but they do vote and they do watch veterans' issues. That's legitimate as far as I'm concerned. And so there's nothing wrong then with military officers who are retired speaking out on the basis of their experience or if they want to go into politics running for office. I think the fuzzy gray zone gets when you're not running that you get really carried away with the partisanship. And I can't say that there's anything that's wrong with it necessarily, but I think it can be a little unbecoming to the profession of arms when you have people up on stage shouting, you know, lock her up and, and a lot of partisan stuff that doesn't reflect the measured good judgment that we expect of senior leaders in the United States Armed Forces. And I think that's the issue really. It's not, it's not the substance, it's the style as much as anything else that's important in how this is done. In terms of the substance, though, following up on Phil's question, do you think that, you know, the media has paid a lot of attention to President Trump using a lot of 
you know, current and former military in significant positions from General Flynn to McMaster to Kelly to Mattis to, you know, the list goes on and on. Do you think that that's overblown? Do you think that, that's, that there's always been that many people at a high level? No, I think there's always been a tendency to look for the legitimacy of the armed forces in, in the, once we ended, once we left World War II and created a standing military, and then we have a series of engagements, there's a certain credibility that the military uniform brings to politicians. And one way or another, they like to be associated with it. I was at a meeting of the uh, American Academy of Achievement when I was NATO commander, and um, I'd never been to this before, and Shali Kashvili was, a, was there, and Colin Powell was there, and Cheney was there, and some other people, and I asked Shali, who'd been there before, I said, should I wear my uniform? This thing's out in Jackson Hole, Wyoming that year. He said, uh, yes, you should wear your uniform. So I, I wore my uniform, and, and General Powell was there in uh, civilian clothes. And he said, oh, I see you suited up, huh? When, you know, you've got the stars glistening on your shoulder, there's a certain legitimacy that comes from the stars or the stripes and the U.S. there that gives extra weight to what you say. And Powell knew it as a retired. At that time, he was a retired uh, and hadn't been Secretary of State but he knew what it meant. So I think, you know, that what's incumbent upon us who have served and are retired is maintain the dignity of the position that we carry. Whether you're going to speak on one side or the other, maintain the dignity, be thoughtful, have evidence. Don't get carried away with the sort of extremes of partisan fervor and political campaigning and start screaming a bunch of stuff that doesn't have any basis and it makes you simply look like a partisan hack. That's not fair to the people that put their trust in you and promoted you and gave you positions of a responsibility. And you're referring to lock her up there, I suppose, since you said it earlier. OK, who else has a question for General Clark? Anyone else? I'm sure one of the cadets must have something to ask. This is your opportunity, so don't, don't waste it. Yes, please. Sir, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jim Goldie, thanks so much for your remarks tonight. Uh, when you talk about uh, your notion of military advice, the two things you, you seem to focus most on were speaking truth to power and telling uh, political leaders your view of what you thought they should do. That seems like a very narrow conception of military advice to me. What role do senior leaders have in providing options to elected leaders? Thanks. Well, it depends on where you are in the decision-making process. So if no decision has been made, then you can give a whole range of options. Um, and so uh, what I saw was when we, I looked at the Haiti operations plan, it had no exit strategy. It was done by the J-3 in conjunction with what was then the Atlantic Command. I went into Shali and said, I, sir, I, this is the first time I've had a chance to see the plan. It doesn't have an exit strategy. It's got a problem without an exit strategy. He said, you're right, fix it. So that's one way to get into it. When we looked at the issue of NATO enlargement, I was opposed to it because Shawley told me he was against it. Holbrook was in favor of it. We had a big argument in the State Department, and I came back and had to apologize to Shawley. I said, I guess I've gotten in trouble again for arguing with Richard Holbrook. And he said, Wes, you're a hero. Everybody in Brussels knows you argued with Richard Holbrook at NATO he's talking about. They don't like Holbrook at NATO. So you never know how these things are going to come out one way or another, but you have a, the responsibility to give your view. Now, when you're engaged in the operation, then I'm saying something different. Now your challenge is to come up with, you know, what is it you're trying to do? MacArthur gave the White House three options. Armistice, withdrawal, or nuclear weapons. It turned out that Truman took armistice, and he fought as hard as he could to get armistice. But MacArthur was well within his rights at the time, as he saw it, and given the understanding at the time on the use of nuclear weapons, to lay out three options. 
when I was in the Kosovo campaign, um, I, I, I said I didn't have a, there wasn't a formal option process. Instead, it was every day there was a video teleconference, and you had to look at this cold screen with the members of the Joint Chiefs and the Sec Def and little tiny heads. You couldn't see their expression, but you're like huge full color up there, and you had to argue for every step. So I tried to explain a strategy of escalation dominance, and that escalation dominance required more targets, more aircraft, strikes at more times of the day and night, going through Romanian and Bulgarian airspace, the use of ATACMs, which never got approved, uh, and the use of the Apaches, which actually never got approved. And ultimately, if nothing else was going to work, then I had to have a plan for a ground option, which I was working on, when finally um, Milosevic broke. But at the same time that I was doing this, Madeleine Albright came to me and said, it's up to you because the White House says that it's my war, they're blaming me. And I told Madeleine that it's not up to the bombing. We're not going to win it with military power. We're going to win it with negotiations, leveraged by the military action. She said, how am I going to do that? She said, the Russians won't even talk to me. So I got together with Madeleine's staff. We wrote up a draft um, agreement that would end the bombing in return for certain political objectives being set. And we got Finnish President Atasari and Russian Vice Premier Chernomyrdin to carry it into Milosevic. And Milosevic accepted it. But he accepted it, I think, with the proviso that there would be a Russian Special Forces operation, which would actually partition Kosovo and give the most valuable parts to the Serbs. So you have to play a different role and have different, do different things at different stages of the operations. Is that a fair answer? Yes, sir. Okay. I think we Is have another one question time over here? for one last question. Yes. Great, thank you. Uh, Mara Carlin, Johns Hopkins Sice. Can you give us an example of a healthy civil military dynamic that you were a part of and your thoughts on why you think it worked? So. That, that's great, and if I could add on to that, I know that there are, there are thoughts about how some civilians think that you can have a cost-free war, whereas military realize that you cannot. And so, in combining with her question, um, do you see a gap in civil-military understanding of casualty aversion, and how do you envision future wars shaping that? So, I guess um, there are several good examples of of successful civil military dialogues, in my experience. The Korea negotiation, um, we were totally integrated between the military and civilian. We ended up with the agreed framework. Um, and we backstopped Ambassador Gallucci all the way. Um, what happened in Bosnia was a good example of excellent civil military relations. I was on the team with Holbrook. We went with a seven-point peace plan. It was backed. We brought George Jowin in, who was then the NATO commander. He supported it. There was bombing at one point. Leighton Smith and George Jowin, Leighton being the uh, Navy commander in the South who ran the bombing, both supported it, and it produced the desired results. So there's a lot of examples of successful work. However, what you have to understand is that, <clears throat> that the more the tensions increase, the more lives are at stake, the more difficult it is to get the compromise. It's easy on the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty because no lives are at stake. But when you're involved with the U.S. Air Force bombing and wanting to take out bridges and professional reputations are at stake versus trying to bring in Apache helicopters or AC-130 gunships, then the tensions go up, the opportunities for compromise go down, and the spread to try to get leverage goes everywhere and goes outside the ranks of the uniformed military to people running to Capitol Hill saying, can you believe they're going to put helicopters in there 
and people saying AC1 and people saying the Air Force can't even get the SAM 6s eliminated. And so it spreads and it gets nasty. What I think you have to understand about, about these operations is that ultimately most people in most of these operations come out of it angry and frustrated and disappointed whether they're on the civil side or the military side. The idea that there's a happy, easy war in which everybody says, oh yeah, that's it, uh, let's go do it. And everybody's on board and it's a success and there are no casualties, probably not going to happen. And certainly not today. So nobody wants to avoid war more than the military. Those who've been in it know three things. They know first that it's about the lives and the health of the organizations they lead. They don't want to see those organizations shattered in combat and the people they love killed. Secondly, they know that when it starts, there'll be political constraints put on them. There's no such thing as pure Clausewitzian war. So you may think you're given the mission, but unless it's an all-out nuclear campaign and the civilian government is destroyed in Washington, you won't get away with worrying without worrying about collateral damages, the rules of war, the rules of engagement, what somebody on the, in Congress says, what the New York Times is reporting, and it all comes back on you. So it's an unpleasant experience. And the higher you go, the more drumsticks are beating on the kettle drum that's on your head. So it's not about parades and glory. It's about pressure, and it's painful pressure. And the third thing the military knows is that if anything goes wrong, really, they'll get the blame. And that's, that's the truth. Maybe that's the right way it should be. But for those who are going to be senior leaders in the military, they have to understand those dynamics when they play in civil military relations. Right. Please join me in thanking General Thank you. Thank you. Sir, sir, as a small token of our appreciation for uh, you coming up and, and, and kicking off our conference, I want to present him the uh, coveted uh, Modern War Institute bullet pen, which <laughs> we think symbolizes uh, the soldier scholar, and to be an effective uh, soldier, we think you also have to be a good scholar as well. You're right. So, thank you, thank you for coming. Sir. Thank you all very much. It's been really great to be with you. I hope that you'll get into these questions and dig into them to your satisfaction over the next three days. Thanks again, Bob. Thanks, Chuck.